All right, this morning, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We were singing uh, that, that song, uh, sec- I think the second to the last song Mike was leading us in, and, and uh, that song about walking out upon the water, and um, when ocean, oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. That's a great song to sing in a climate-controlled environment, in a comfortable chair, with all your Christian friends surrounding you, supporting you. But you think about, when oceans are rising, I'm going to rest in your embrace. You know, like if I'm about to drown, I'll just rest in your arms. And uh, what I wanted to uh, focus on this morning is this section of Scripture where Paul is in a situation like that, like what we were just singing and thanking God for uh, his strength in in the midst of great difficulty or challenge. And uh, we're reading in verse 7 is where we'll start, Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure. By the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Lord, we thank you that uh, you've revealed your truth to us in, in so um, such a clear way, Lord, in so many different ways. And, and we thank you, Lord, that uh, though our world is so upside down and so your truth comes in a way like it's a paradox, that when we're weak, that's when we're strong. We, we're, we're so... Uh, we're so deviated from the truth that, that the actual truth sounds like a paradox. And so, Lord, help us to understand and to grasp those spiritual realities of, of what real strength is and how to find it, that we might find it, Lord. As we were singing that song, Lord, and, and the other songs we were singing this morning, so much of them are about the victory of faith and, and just the reality of who you are and how triumphant you are and our rejoicing in you. It, and yet, Lord, we, we all live it. We know, God, that that's not, it's easy to say. It's definitely more difficult to do. And so instruct us, Lord. Strengthen us with your word. Teach us. Uh, build us up. Exhort us this morning that we would hear your voice, that we would be transformed, Lord, our minds renewed, and that we would truly be able to leave this place after just a short time together, truly strengthened with power and, and filled, Lord, infused with strength from heaven. And, and a victory, Lord, that you give, and may we walk in it, Lord. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of those passages of Scripture that has uh, those paradoxes. There's, there's many that are in the Scripture. If you want to be exalted, then you have to humble yourself. If, if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. If you exalt yourself, and then you're going to be humbled. So I mean, it's just uh, the opposite of the way the world says. The world says, if you want to be exalted, exalt yourself. Jesus said, no, it's the other way around. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then be the least of all. That's a paradox. Paradox is something that sounds like it can't possibly be true. It's the opposite. And here is one of them, and this is a powerful one, where Jesus said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Strength and weakness would sort of be understood as being mutually exclusive. If you're strong, that means you're not weak. If you're weak, that means you're not strong. You can't be both simultaneously. And yet, Jesus isn't saying that you'd be both simultaneously. He'd say if you're the one, you're actually the other. <laughs> and, and Paul was learning this in his own way as he describes it here for the Corinthians. In verse 7, he talks about um, these revelations that he had, and he mentions those in the previous verses. He, he talks about a man who was caught up into heaven and saw these, these great revelations of, of heaven, but he said he wasn't uh, given permission to speak about those things, and so he wouldn't be exalted, verse 7. So he wouldn't be exalted above measure because of these revelations. And then it's generic. It says a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. There's different opinions that people have, but Paul didn't specify what it was. And I think that that's important because if he specified his thorn in the flesh and that was different than yours, then you might be tempted to think that this doesn't apply to you. So it's, it's in the most general way. A thorn in the flesh. Now, have you ever had a thorn in your flesh? 
I mean, literally. You go out to prune the roses, you got a thorn. Thorn in the flesh is pretty strong. Uh, it's a, just a sharp pain. It's something you can't forget about easily. If it happens, you know immediately that it happened. So it's, this is something painful, something that is, is uh, from, uh, in his body, but he says the next from the devil, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So this thing that's like a thorn in his flesh is beating him, and it's from the devil. Now, if that's happening to you, doesn't that seem like that's not God's will for your life? Satan has sent something that's given me a beat down, and it's like a thorn in my flesh. Like, well, that, God can't allow that. That's, that's not what God's will for my life is. And uh, this, is the, this is the challenge of this passage, because while he has this thing, verse 8, he says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Jesus did not take away that attack from the devil. Jesus did not take away that thorn that was in his flesh. He had it, it was painful, and he said, oh Lord, this is from the devil. The devil's buffeting me. Lord, get this out of my life. And then Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. No, Lord, you didn't understand my prayer. I know your grace is sufficient. I love your grace. Get the thorn out of my life. I'm not praying about your grace. I love it. I have it. I'm so thankful for it. Just the thorn is the only subject we're talking about. Take it out of my life. I don't want this attack from the devil in my life anymore. Get rid of it. Then Jesus speaks again. My grace is enough for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. No, I know your power is made perfect in weakness. I know that your grace is sufficient. These are basic, you know, foundational doctrinal ideas. Your strength is all that we need. Your love is all that we need. But I'm talking about this thorn. That's the thing. Let's just move it out of my life. And again, the answer. So he prays three times, and, and then after three times, he stopped. Now, why is that it that he stopped? For the same reason you stopped praying about some things. You realize, all right, Lord, I guess the answer is no here. And then you start to work through that process when God says no. So, Lord, this is from the devil. It's painful. I don't like it. It's, it's causing me to be weak. It's, it's bringing me to the end of my strength and I'd like for it to go, and then the Lord says no. What I want to talk about this morning, and we're going to walk through this passage, uh, is how to find strength. And the first step we just covered, and that is to pray. When you're in a place in your life, when you're feeling weak, and you're feeling like you can't go on, and you feel like, I don't, I, I have these circumstances, whatever it might be, whatever thorn it is, it's generic, something has happened to you, and it's brought you to the end of yourself, and you don't know, I don't know that I can go through another day. I don't even want to think about a whole week, because I, I know I can't get through a whole week, but I don't even want to think about a day. And, and then you look within, and you try to find some energy, and there is no strength. The first step is to pray. The first thing you want to do is pray. That's how you find strength. You want to pray, and that's what Paul does here. He has a thorn in the flesh. He's at the end of himself, and verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord that it might depart. That's where you want to begin. And you'll notice here that his prayer is that it would depart. We can infer that from verse 8. He says, that it might depart from me. I pleaded with the Lord that it might depart from me. So Lord, take this out of my life. That's one way of communication, but prayer is two-way communication. So as he spoke to God, then God spoke back to him. And Jesus' answer back is not the answer that Paul wanted to have Lord, make this thing go out of my life. And you, the answer you want in that situation is, okay, I'm taking it out of your life, and then now it's gone. But the answer wasn't that. The answer was, it's going to stay in your life. My grace will be enough for you. I want you, instead of focusing on the pain from the thorn, I want you rather to focus on my grace, and I want you to understand that my, my power is made perfect in weakness. Your weakness is not hindering you like you think it is. So, the two-way communication. and this. So pray, number one, but remember when you're praying, you also, when you're looking for strength and you're coming to the Lord in a difficult time and you're asking, you want to remember that you also want to make room in your prayer life for listening. You don't just have a one, prayer's not a one-way radio that doesn't receive, okay? It's not just a transmitter. I've got the prayer transmitter, I don't have any receiver, and I only send messages. It just goes one way to God. This is what you're doing. Out, 10-4, you know, no, it, the messages come back, and the, the message might be, 
Uh, no, that's not what I'm doing. Out. <laughs> no, that is what you're doing. Out. <laughs> Over. <laughs> yes, this is, I'm going to do this, and I don't care what you say. I mean, you know, it's, it's two-way. That's what's happening with Paul. And this is really important as we're talking about strength because the easiest way to find strength is when you're in a situation, that situation brings you to the point of prayer, and then you pray, and God wants to answer yes. This would be a really short Bible study. We would already be done. I'd say, let's close in prayer. Mike, come and lead us in a song about answered prayer. You know, That is how you find strength many times. You're in a situation, Lord, right now, come through, and then God does it. You experience an answer. There's provision. There's the money that shows up. The people show up. The, the confusion is just lifted out of the situation or whatever happens. There's an answer, and you're delivered, and you find strength when God says yes. But when God says no, that doesn't mean you still can't find strength. And a lot of times in our lives, God doesn't just say yes immediately. Sometimes the circumstances are more nuanced, and God has a different plan than what we were thinking of. And that's the case here. Paul's thinking, this thing has brought my strength level down, and I need to have full strength to do the things that God wants me to do. And so change this so that I get back up here. And then God's saying, well, actually, you're, you're not understanding. I actually like you better when you're weak. I, I need you weaker than you are. And when you're stronger, you're actually weaker. And for you, Paul, when you get weaker, you're actually better. It's better for you when you have less strength. And so God will hear our prayers and he'll answer us. And when he speaks to us, we begin to find strength because when we're in these difficult situations that we don't understand or, or we're facing something that's beyond our ability and we begin to talk to God about it and he begins to speak back to us, our understanding um, becomes more full. We start to understand, well, the Lord might be trying to do something I didn't totally get. The Lord may want to take this in a direction that I wasn't expecting. I thought this was going to be exactly like this, but actually the Lord wants to do something else. And it's in that moment when we begin to learn how to listen to the Lord and his correction, then we start to find strength. If we go to that place and God starts to reveal something to us and we don't really like what he's saying and so we stubbornly hold out and we keep going, we're not going to find the strength. We're going to just sort of be beating our head against the wall and we'll find ourselves frustrated. Um, I've experienced it myself many, many times and and tragically it seems to be a lesson that is difficult to learn and and hold on to because even though I think I've learned it, I find myself relearning it and relearning it But this is very, very important. Paul prayed, but then he also listened. And it's in that that beginning point of when God starts to say, I'm doing something more than what you thought. And you're you're not really going to like it, what I'm going to do, but you need to surrender to it. You you don't understand it. When he speaks, that's when we begin to find strength. And I I think that that is something that as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, um, that we, we really learn to find energy and strength and power in God's answer to us. And this is something that you want to be growing into, especially if you're a new believer. Remember, if you're newer to the faith, that the different kinds of soil that Jesus talked about where the seed gets planted, remember that parable? Some soil's really hard and the seed doesn't even go in and it lands and then the birds eat it. Other soil goes in but the soil's really shallow and it starts really quick. The seed's able to germinate because the sunlight, there's some moisture there, but the soil's not very deep and there's a hard pan the hard soil underneath. And so the thing springs up, but as soon as Jesus said that the sun and the the wind, they beat on that plant and it dies. It withers up. It never bears fruit. He said, those are the people that hear the word of God and they receive it immediately, but as soon as hardship comes and trials, then they fall away. And it's it's that, this is that issue here. So here's Paul and Lord, I'm, I'm going and I need your strength. Oh, Satan's attacking me. And Lord, take this away from me. And the Lord says, I'm not taking it away from you. So Paul, what are you going to do? Is this a place where you fall away? Is this a place where you say, well, if that's what you're going to do with my life, then I don't want this. How many people will profess that they believe in Jesus Christ, but the following of Jesus isn't there? A profession, yeah, I believe in him, but you don't follow him. Oh, I'm not following him. And deep down, there's a desire and there's some kind of wishing that it was true or that they want to be in a right relationship with God, but but I want my life to go the way I want it to go and not surrendering 
will really hinder us from being able to find strength. So listening to God, talking to him, sharing, that's the first place. And a lot of times that's where we get our strength immediately. You prayed and God got you out of it. Isn't that awesome when that happens? But that doesn't always happen. You pray and then the Lord doesn't change the circumstance. He says, actually, these circumstances are perfectly designed to make you weak. And will I receive that? Will I be open to that? And I think that we find that once God speaks about our situation and we say, well, all right, Lord, if you know what you're doing, then I'll surrender. If oceans rise, then my soul will find rest in your embrace. If, if I'm out upon the water, as we were singing in that song, if I'm in a situation and it's not looking really good, I'm going to still find my strength in you. And I don't understand it. And I don't know. Um, is Satan's attacking. There's a thorn in my flesh. But Jesus' answer is, my grace is sufficient for you. And this is the second step. Pray and communicate with God would be the first step. The second step would be focus on the grace of God. I think that's what Jesus is getting at when he's answering Paul here and why Paul shares it with us. Take this thing out of my life, and Jesus' answer is, my grace is enough. I want you to focus on my grace instead. Now, here's something about life that um, is challenging because... Many times we have things happening in our lives that just bring us so much joy and so much peace and so much strength, but other times in our lives we have things happening that take away all of our joy and all of our peace and all of our strength. And if we're subjected to the whims of our life on this planet to be able to have peace, like, well, who has peace? Well, I don't have peace right now. This and this and this happened. Like, oh man, you're right. Sorry. You can sit over on this side of the church. Well, who does have peace? Well, I do, man. I just got this, and then this happened, and that happened. Okay, then you sit over here. And we would be switching sides all the time, wouldn't we? One say, hey, I thought you were over here with on the peace. Oh, man, I had a terrible week. I'm on this side now. We would have musical chairs in the congregation, everybody moving every week, probably during the service. <laughs> Maybe sometime in the sermon. You know, you get up and go, ah, I'm, I'm out of here. You know, you go to the other, you go to the unpeaceful side. And that was a little too close to home. I mean, you know, if, if our lives, if we were going to find peace and find some kind of strength and it was dependent upon our circumstances, man, we are just like a kite blowing around in the wind. It just depends upon whatever's happening that week or that season of our lives. Have you had a season where everything goes wrong? Have you had a season? I remember my dad uh, years ago lost his best friend, his youngest brother, and his mom within about four months. Pretty radical season in his life. And I remember, I mean, I was close to all three of those people. It was a radical season of my life. I lost my grandmother, my favorite uncle, and, and uh, you know, another man who was like a mentor to me. And my dad, you know, we, we were facing it differently. But that, you have those seasons, like, what is happening? How can this be happening right now? You have a sickness happen. You, you could have financial trials. You could have everything breaks in the house. It seems like all at the same time they're... There's these different situations that happen. And, and then if, if my peace is going to be found in what I find on this planet, then I'm going to have peace that's going to be like flip the coin. Well, are you going to have peace, Rich? Well, I don't know. What, tell me what's happening. I'll tell you how, my, how I'm going to be. So Jesus is telling us the secret. He's telling Paul. Paul's telling us what Jesus told him. My grace is enough for you. So what do I focus on if I want to be able to have peace? And where do I focus on if I want to have joy? What will I focus on? And can I focus on this no matter what? Can I focus on this if the doctors tell me, like in my case, I remember on a Christmas Eve, my, my wife almost passed away. She had a pregnancy that was, uh, didn't make it all the way to the uterus. It had got lodged in the fallopian tube and began to grow popped the tube out of the uterus, and her blood was just pumping into her abdomen. She lost over half of her blood. We didn't even know she was pregnant. And uh, we realized it on Christmas Eve in the emergency room. You know, the hospital's totally empty, and, and I'm all alone, and, I'm, and the guy's telling me, you know, she might end up with AIDS. This was, this was in, um, after Zach, so this had been like 1991, I think, early 92. And, uh, you know, here, here I am thinking... You know, this is, this is, I got two little kids. My wife may not make it through this surgery. She's lost over half of her blood. And if they give her, they're going to have to give her blood. And who knows if the blood's not going to be tainted. And I'm thinking of all these different things. Listen, I didn't have any peace. I didn't have any joy. I didn't have any strength for that moment. I'm sitting all by myself. But then 
Jesus shows up, right? When, you've, when you experience the love of God in a terrible moment, you realize the love of God transcends whatever moment I might be in. My grace is sufficient. And I can tell you, even in that circumstance, for me, as much as I was disturbed, and, I, and, my, my, and Jesus didn't tell me everything was going to be okay. He just told me that he loved me. And it, di- it wasn't that he changed my circumstance. It's just that he revealed himself to me. That was, a one, that was one of the, my, my most cherished experiences with the Lord, is the way that he came and met me in that moment. So precious to me. I would never want to go through that again, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. My grace is sufficient. The love of God demonstrated on the cross of Jesus Christ, that God loves you. There's no doubt about that God loves you. All you have to do is think about the cross of Jesus. Now, you may have a thorn in your flesh, and you might be saying, Lord, don't you love me? I've got a thorn in my flesh. I asked you to take it away, and for some reason you're not taking it away. I'm questioning your love. Well, my grace is sufficient. Get your eyes off of the thorn in your flesh and put your eyes back on the cross and say, well, I don't know why this thorn is here, but I have no doubt that God loves me. I don't know why he's allowing this, because this seems like a terrible idea. But I have no doubt that God loves me. He's demonstrated his love for me when Jesus bore the guilt and the shame and the penalty for my sin when he died for me. When he died on the cross, he was dying for all of us, but he was dying for me. My sin was carried by Jesus. He atoned for it. He suffered death. He took my place and paid my price, and I'm accepted by God in Jesus Christ. Now, if I can get my eyes on that in the midst of whatever I'm going through, his grace is sufficient, accepted in the Beloved, knowing the acceptance of God. There's no thorn in my flesh that can make me unaccepted by God. God's accepted me. I've got the hope of heaven. I've got the joy of my salvation. The joy of my salvation is not dependent upon the joy of my circumstances. Believe me, I like the joy of my circumstances. I hope that the football game today is a pretty good football game. I hate it when the Super Bowl is a blowout. I kind of have a feeling this one might turn into a blowout. The one team is just steamrolling everybody, but at least the first half, and then second half will go down and be a blowout. That way you guys will come to church <laughs> tonight. You know, we're having communion tonight. It'll be great. And you can always record it if it's good, and, you know, if you watch it, you know, like God watches, you know, you'll know ahead of time what's going to happen, you know. It's like theological football. You know, I want to I have the joy of my circumstances. I want... You know, I, if I go to a restaurant and I order a meal, I'd like it to be good. I don't want it to be bad. I, I want to be able to have something to have them bring it. You know, man, they cooked this perfectly. You know, you want to see your friends. You want to have great... Con- I mean, you know, there's just all so much joy and, and, and satisfaction that comes from just living our lives when things go a certain way. It's just, it's just good. That's a certain kind of joy. But things aren't always like that. Sometimes everything goes wrong. And if the only, play, the only way I can find strength or peace or joy is if everything's going the way that pleases me, then I'm just not going to have that very often. But if I have the joy of my salvation, and if I walk with my eyes focused on Jesus and on the grace that has been given to me, that I'm saved from my guilt, that I don't have to be ashamed that I'm accepted by God, that the penalty of sin is gone, and that I've got the presence of God in my life. The great promises, Hebrews 13, verse 5, quoting from several places in the Old Testament. It, the, the writer to Hebrews says, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. No matter what kind of thorn in my flesh that I might have, no matter how Satan might be attacking me, God said, I will never leave you. I will never be in a place where I will be left by God. I will never be abandoned by God. He will never leave me behind. He will never never abandon me. He's accepted me in Jesus, and he's with me. Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. His last words, according to Matthew, you know, the end of the Great Commission. And I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The presence of God with me. My grace is sufficient for you. When I'm in a situation where I've got a thorn in my flesh, and it's brought my strength all the way down to nothing... It's really easy for me to just zero in on that and go, this is horrible. This is a stupid situation. Oh, God, make it change. Silence, crickets, no noise, nothing from God, except for the, the terrible feeling that maybe he's not going to take it away. And I continue to pray, and then that's so easy to become focused on that when Jesus is saying, no, no, turn your focus. I'm with you. Look for me. I'm still here. 
God won't abandon me in the middle of a difficulty. I have the presence of God in my life because of grace. I don't have to look at a trial and say, man, this is my own fault. God must hate me. No, he loves me. And if he's allowed a trial in my life, he's not going to not be there. He's there with me. Receive God's love. The focus on the grace of God. When Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, that means my grace is sufficient. It's enough. I'm ready to give you grace. I'm ready in this moment when the thorn has brought you low, I'm ready to put something else inside of you. I'm ready for my grace to be enough for you. I'm ready to give you my love. I'm ready to blow your mind with how high it is and how deep it is and how far it goes in every direction. We can receive God's love. If you want to find strength, you start by receiving God's love, receiving the love of God, knowing it. And then this second half of the statement of Jesus, the third step, he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So first step is pray and communicate with God how to find strength. Second, focus on the grace of God. That's what Jesus said. My grace is sufficient for you. Then third step is his strength is made per- perfect in weakness. The idea of perfect is uh, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a weird, uh, weird's not the right way to say it. It's, we use the word perfect differently than this word that Paul is using means perfect. Um, and it's kind of a sh- it's shame. It's not a giant shame, but it's a little bit a shame that um, the translation is as, is as perfect because um, when we use the word perfect, the way, at least the way I understand English in my own cultural microcosm of my life, perfect means without flaw. If I say, man, this is perfect, it means it gets complete in the sense that there's nothing wrong with it. This, this means that, but it has a kind of a different emphasis. And the way that the, this word, that, and it's used all over the New Testament, and it's, it has the emphasis of finished, or it's completed. When Jesus was on the cross, it is finished. It's from the same root word here. It's all over the place. You are complete in him. It's not the idea of perfection as that there's no flaw. It's that it's a finished work. It's a finished thing. It's a completed thing. The idea is of that. This is where the end is. And so Jesus is saying that my strength will be able to go all the way and finish what it needs to do no matter how weak you are. In fact, your weakness provides the venue or the opportunity for my strength to be finished, for it to go and become all that it, it's supposed to be. It's your weakness that provides the opportunity. Strength received in the midst of weakness, or maybe in some cases because of weakness. Here's something interesting. As Paul then goes on to talk about his response in verse eight, 9 and 10, he says, Therefore... I will gladly rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproach, in need, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You see, Paul had, through this difficult circumstance, as he was praying and God was answering him with a no, Lord, take this away, and the answer is no, I'm not taking it away. Then he started to learn something. He realized then, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. He didn't always know that. Now, this is something that's really hard for us because normally we go through our lives assessing our weaknesses constantly and making decisions based upon our personal strength or our personal weakness. And that's a good thing, right? You see something and you think, man, I shouldn't try that. That's, I don't have strength to be able to do that. That keeps you alive. That's a safety mechanism. You know, that, and that's, our, that's a frame of reference of how we live so much of our life. We chose a career. What career? You're like, I'm going to choose this. I'm terrible at it. No, you don't do that. You say, well, I'm not good at this or this, but I seem to be pretty good at this, so I'm going to try this. You don't go, I'll never be able to make a living at this. This is actually the worst thing I could ever do. I'll do that. You don't do that. I mean, that, you, if you did, change. Don't do that anymore. I mean, that's not, I mean, that's just not, we don't work like that. But when it comes to Christianity and our self-reliance and our pride and our flesh, that the normal way of life on the earth and the corruption of of our life on this planet, that when it comes to Christ, our personal strengths actually sometimes can hinder us from relying upon God's strength. In fact, what Paul's experiencing here, what he describes for us, what we learn from, we've learned it ourselves in our own life too. We've had similar experiences as Paul's describing, is that actually Jesus 
will create circumstances that will bring us down so we really don't have anything to trust in so that then actually in that moment, finally we'll trust in him completely when we would have been trusting in ourselves. Self-confidence is an enemy for confidence in God. Self-reliance is an enemy of relying upon God. Um, Trusting in our own strength is an enemy to receiving God's strength, and it's a hindrance. If I get filled up with trusting in my own strength, there's no room to trust in God's strength. And so um, Paul here says, I realize that when I have infirmities and when I'm being reproached, when I have needs, when I'm being persecuted, and when I have distresses, these are, none of these are situations that anybody would want to be in. An infirmity is a sickness or a physical weakness that brings you to the end of yourself. Have you ever had one of those? Yeah, you have. You've been sick like that. You don't want that. Paul says, when I have that, I've discovered that in those moments when I'm weakest, then actually God's strength is still there. When I'm being reproached, that means everyone's attacking me. People are falsely accusing me. People are are against me. And he's just, he says, for Christ's sake, he's trying to do what's right. And now he's being totally attacked for it. He goes, in that moment, and you know how reproach brings you down. Imagine if you, after church, went on your Facebook and you had 100 comments negative attacking you for some post you made yesterday about the Lord. I mean, you'd be bummed. I mean, it would affect you immediately. And you, and you know how it's so great to have a discussion on Facebook about important issues and how easy it is. <laughs> and so you start trying to write back and clear up the confusion. And now, now all of a sudden you're viral and they're talking about you on the news. <laughs> would you be bummed out? I mean, it, when there's a reproach in your life, it, it weighs you down. You just have two or three people mad at you, and you're weighed down, aren't you? You, you know, so, you hear, you know, so-and-so is mad. You're like, wait, what happened? Why? You try to call him, click, call back, you get the answer machine. I mean, you know, it's disturbing. In a, in a time of, of, of emotional difficulty that you think, man, this is terrible, that doesn't mean there's no strength there. If you look at these. These are not easy words. Persecution, necessity, distress. These are all situations my needs aren't met. I'm stressed out over it. I'm being attacked. He says, when those things are happening, I've actually learned that in the midst of that difficulty, I need to start looking for strength. It's in that moment and I realize I, God's strength is right here. It's ready. God's ready to pour it out. That's, he's not a masochist when he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, or I gladly boast in infirmities in verses 10 and then back in verse 9. It's not that he's rejoicing in the trials or the difficulties. What it is is that he's realized when these things are like this and I realize that I'm at the end of myself, then I know that God will be right here ready. He's ready to give me what I don't have. I've learned it. I learned it in this situation and now I've I've begun to live like this. This is my mode of operation, that God's strength I receive it in the midst of my weakness, and I begin to look for God's strength in the midst of my weakness. I'm looking for God to express his strength to me in the midst of my weakness. And when I run out of ideas, and I run out of money, and I run out of energy, and I run out of time, and then I look at the situation and I say, God's going to do it right now. This has to be God, because there's no way out. The Lord's never going to leave me or forsake me. I'm focused on his grace. He's going to do something. And that's why he said, I'm, I will take pleasure then in these things because I know that when I'm weak, that's when God's strength will come through. So a couple things we have to recognize if we're going to be able to do that. Number one, don't look in the wrong place. If you want to find strength in the midst of your weakness and so you realize I'm going, to, I'm going to look for it, don't look in the wrong place. Now, how many times have you looked for something and you couldn't find it because you were looking in the wrong place? Duh, every time, Right? Every time you're looking for something and you don't find it, you didn't find it because you're looking in the wrong place. That's why we have wives. <laughs> Man, my wife, she can find anything. She knows where everything is. She's magical for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons she's magical is that girl finds everything. The problem is her husband doesn't look very hard, and usually, you know, uh, now it's kind of like, did you look under anything? Well, not yet. I thought I'd ask you. I knew that. You know, I know that you know where it is. I'm always looking in the wrong place. And then she'll say, she'll just tell me where to look. Did you look here? Oh, no, I didn't. Well, look there. And it's always exactly where she said it was. You're looking for something. You can look all day if you don't look in the right place. You'll never find it, 
right? I mean, that's just uh, common sense. So if you want to find strength, don't look in the wrong place. And where do we normally look? We normally look at our, ourselves. It's, it's normal. It's how we survived, right? You know, um, you're going down the street. Your neighborhood's a rough neighborhood. I, what neighborhood I grew up in was a rough neighborhood. I'm going down the street. I see a couple guys. I make a calculation quick, and I say, I could take probably both those guys, or at least make them not want to fight me, you know, and I'm fine. Then I, and I'm going on a little further. I see three guys, and I decide I'm not going this way anymore. I go through over someone's fence and through the neighborhood, and <laughs> I'm out of there, you know? I'm, you're making calculations all the time. And, and most of the time, the basis is, what am I going to be able to handle? Your, your, your kids are applying, you know, they're, they're getting their college schedule. They're looking at the, the catalog, and they're going, oh, that looks, that's a hard math class. That's hard. Oh, basket weaving? Oh, I can, I can do that, you know? <laughs> I got to fill out my general ed, you know? Oh, and, and now you got rate my professor. What is that all about? It's not find a hard professor. It's avoid the hard, you want to find them so you don't find them. I mean, our lives are constantly around what am I going to be able to do? How do I minimize my risks? I mean, that's just our, and it's all about self-preservation. God's working to try to change our frame of reference to be about him so that our whole life is about Jesus and our eyes are fixed upon him so that as we go through our life, it's not about us. It's, well, what's the Lord doing? What's the Lord said? What's he trying to accomplish? He can do anything. He can do anything through anybody. So don't trust in myself or anyone else for that matter. It's easy to either trust in ourselves, or if you have, you're blessed to have people in your life that you can count on, but they're not always going to be there, and they're not perfect. So even though you might be able to count on them most of the time, there, there's going to be times definitely where you can't count on them. And so we need to learn to look to God and to his resources. This is something that so often doesn't happen until I have a thorn in my flesh. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've apologized to God for relearning this lesson or saying, Lord, you've been so good to me and so faithful. There's no reason I wouldn't automatically look to you. And I'm so sorry that here I am again and I didn't look to you first. And thank you for allowing this situation to bring me low, to remind me that really you're it, and you're all that there is, and I'm reminded, just thank you for that. And I know you're going to do it. And how many times have I been in that place? And I remember the first time where it was like, Paul, you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you're battling, and then you finally realize, oh, man, you know, God had to let this thing, God had to let my life get to this point. He had to let this thing into my life. He had to let this thorn get me so that I would finally realize, what in the world can I do anyways? Now, you should be able to learn that pretty easy, right? I mean, we could probably have a couple of volunteers. Could, could we have some volunteers that travel around and just let all of us know, remind us that we're, we can't do anything? I mean, that, that's, not, that's pretty logical walking up to somebody, hey, man, you're nothing. Welcome to Calvary. You know, that's my role here. I'm the new uh, you're nothing usher, and I just let everybody know. I mean, that, like, well, yeah, duh, of course I know that. When we can know something here, but then when our, our mode of operation is so self-centered and so self-reliant and so about self-gratification, that sometimes it can take a heavy situation to bring us to the end of ourself. So don't look in the wrong place. When you come to the end of yourself, don't look in the wrong place. One of the great things about getting that rock bottom is when you're at rock bottom, there's only, man, you're, when you're at the bottom, there, there's God. I mean, there's nothing else there. Like, you're done. And that is the, there is a blessing there. And don't look in the wrong place. Then the second lesson related to finding strength specifically, is finding your strength, how do you find it, is, is waiting upon the Lord. We want to wait upon the Lord. And I uh, thought it was great, um, the choice of songs that Mike um, had for us this morning. We were, singing, we were singing the Bible study before we had it. You know, Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. You sang that song, right? Did you sing those words? Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. What does that mean? When we sing that, what are we saying? Well, when we, when we wait on the what does it mean to wait on the Lord? How do we do it? Well, the famous passage, Isaiah 40, if you want to flip over there, it's kind of in the middle of your Bible. If you open your Bible sort of to the middle, you'll be close to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, the last few verses. 
Verse 28 to 31, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So God's fine, nothing wrong with him. Then verse 29, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So weakness and lack of power does not mean you're forever without weak in that state or without power, because God gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Verse 31, even youths will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So even natural strength, someone in the prime with all the natural strength, will still come to the end. But God's strength, verse 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord. Now, when Isaiah is prophesying, Israel in the south uh, is being tempted to not look to God for their strength. Because historically, Isaiah is prophesying right around the time when the northern part of Israel, the northern kingdom made up of the ten tribes of the north, they're conquered by the Assyrian army. They come in and they destroy the northern kingdom. They take them away. Remember they had had a civil war and they separated politically. So the south was two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. Their capital is Jerusalem. And they've got a godly king, Hezekiah. And there was a temptation during that time of looking to Egypt. Egypt was very powerful. The Egyptians and the Assyrians were going to have a couple of major battles, the famous battle of Carchemish that they would have um, You know, there's several battles of Carchemish, but these two powers are are coming together and they're meeting in Israel. And there's a temptation in the south of the Egyptians are your only hope. Trust in Egypt, man, their military might. This alliance with Egypt is how you're going to preserve your national identity. Your, your, Your life will be saved by trusting in the Egyptians. And God's answer is don't go down to Egypt and think that Egyptians are going to help you. It's the Lord. This, this prophecy or this statement, this truth is uttered in a time when Israel is, well, what are you going to trust in? Hey, we're going to wait on the Lord. We're going to look to him. We're going to have our eyes upon Jesus. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And the southern kingdom survived the Assyrian attack. The Assyrians came down and surrounded Jerusalem and threatened them. And an angel of the Lord went out and wiped out the army in, in the one night and they fled and It's interesting, you read Assyrian history at the time, and it talks about how they came into the land and they destroyed the north, how they came to Jerusalem and laid siege, and then that's the end. (laughs) It doesn't say they conquered Jerusalem, and and, uh, actually, historically, the king that laid siege went back and was murdered by uh, his servants, and there was a change in the Assyrian leadership at that time, but they were delivered. Um, One of the great passages about waiting on the Lord is Lamentations. Lamentations is right after Jeremiah. So if you can go from Isaiah to Jeremiah, follow Jeremiah to the end of the road, and you'll find this little book of Lamentations. And in Lamentations, Jeremiah writing this sad song about his struggles that he had faced, and it's similar in some way to to Paul having a thorn in his flesh. It's much more um, intense. Jeremiah was prophesying uh, about 150 years, roughly, I mean, more or less, Um, a little over 100 years um, after Isaiah when the southern kingdom would be destroyed and they never listened to him and so he, he's got a hard lot. He describes how difficult his circumstances are in chapter 3. It's an interesting um, description of, of how he felt his pain. Verse 1, he says, I'm the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. So God's the one who's done this to me. Verse 2, he led me and he made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He's aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He's besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. Sound a little depressed to you? I'm in a dungeon with dead carcasses. God's fighting me. He put me in the dark and he beats me. That's just the first five verses. Six verses. Verse 7, he hedged me in so I can't get out. He made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He blocked my ways with hewn stone, and he's made my paths crooked. That doesn't sound very nice. I'm trying to go on a straight path, and God's like, messed up my GPS. It's going to the wrong place. 
He's been to me, verse 10, like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. He's turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for the arrow. That's not nice. He put a kick me sign on my back. Verse 13, he caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I've become the ridicule of all my people. They're taunting song all day long. Everyone, you know, everyone's against me. People are singing songs. Jeremiah's an idiot, idiot. I mean, that's what, isn't that what he said? I've become the ridicule of my people. They're taunting song all day long. They're writing songs about him and mocking him. Verse 15, he filled me with bitterness and he made me drink wormwood, poison. Verse 16, he broke my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You've moved my soul far from peace. I've forgotten prosperity. Have you ever been so sad or feeling so melancholy or hopeless that you can't even remember? And someone says, well, don't you remember? Like, you're like, no, I can't even remember anymore. He says, I forgot. I forgot prosperity. I forgot what normal was. Then he said, verse 18, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. I'm given up. Remember my affliction and my roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. Now, between verses 20 and 21, something happens. And it happens in his mind. Verse 21. This I recall to my mind. So as we're looking in 2 Corinthians, and how do we find strength? Paul has a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan. It's brought him low. He's got infirmities, reproaches, weaknesses, whatever. And he's, he, so he prays, God will take it away. God doesn't take it away. The message is, my grace is sufficient. So what does Jeremiah remember? I remember this. I call this to my mind, and therefore I have hope. Look at verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies were not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The, the sad song changes at this moment of 20 verses of total just heartache poured out of all of the pain that he feels from all the difficulty that God's let him go through. And then he says, but I started thinking about this. So what did he think about? My grace is sufficient for you. It's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. His compassions don't fail. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His eyes came off of his broken teeth with gravel and his you know, spears in his back from, and arrows from God's quiver and, and his enemies mocking him and all of those things that were just weighed him down and rightly so would weigh him down and, and bring him to the point of despair. But then I started to think about the mercy of the Lord and I started to think about the faithfulness of God and I started thinking about the plan of God and I don't really like this plan that I'm living in but I started to remind myself of God's love for me. God's love for his people, God's ultimate plan. And then I, I realized that I needed to get my eyes off of this and get my eyes back on the Lord. He says in verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. Finding God is my all. That's what I'm looking, I'm, I just want God. Well, God's always there for me. He's my portion, I'm gonna hope in him. And then again, this idea of waiting on the Lord and finding strength. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It's good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Now, he says that, and I can read that, and I believe that, but I've been waiting and hoping for the salvation of the Lord, and it doesn't always feel good. <laughs> Do the first 20 verses sound like it's good? It doesn't so much. But when he gets his eyes onto the mercy of the Lord, then he can say, it's good for a man to wait for the Lord. If you wait on the Lord, what will happen? You'll get new strength. And God will do what God wants to do. It may not be what you want to have happen. And it may take a while for it to be unfolded how this is going to work out for good. But God will never fail us. He never will. We need to learn to wait on the Lord. And what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Well, it's what Paul describes here. It's that, that change that happens where in verse back in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, I prayed that this thing would go away and then I listened and God told me it wasn't going away and I didn't give up for three times. I prayed three times that it would go away and three times he told me the same thing. 
And then waiting on the Lord is that first therefore in verse 9. When he says, therefore, most gladly, I'll rather boast. It's that what happens inside of a person when they decide, all right, Lord, all right then. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. It means to surrender. Are you, am I going to just say, all right, that's it, you're right. It's, we'll go the way you go. And that moment, all of a sudden now, the channel is open and strength can start pouring in. As long as God's trying to do something and I'm going, over your dead body, God. <laughs> I don't want it to be like this. And I'm praying and I'm fighting and I'm striving and I won't humble myself, then I'm not waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord has everything to do with that internal mechanism when we throw up our hands and we say, okay, Lord, I don't know why you let this happen. I don't like it that you let this happen, but I know you love me and I'm open to what you're doing in my life. I, I need you. Without you, I will never make it. And when a person throws up their hands and then they surrender, that's waiting on the Lord. That's when you're waiting. Waiting on the Lord is not sitting in, a wait, in God's waiting room where you're going, man, look at, and you're looking at the clock, go tick, tick, tick. <laughs> Sometimes inactivity in frustration is the, is the opposite of waiting. Yeah, you're waiting because God's sovereign. He's in control. But in my stubborn pride as I'm sitting there going, you better make this over quick. I mean, that's not waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is surrender. Lord, my life belongs to you. Lord, I, I need you, and without you, I got nothing. And so in the midst of this difficulty that's brought me to the end of myself, I'm going to find your strength. And here's the reality. The last uh, part about finding strength, the last sub-point. So under finding strength, it was don't look in the wrong place, wait on the Lord. And the last one is, Receive the strength. <laughs> Receive it. God wants to give strength. He gives strength to the weak. He gives power to those who have no might. Those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. God, those who wait on the Lord will never be ashamed. You know, there's a whole bunch of promises related to waiting on the Lord, related to victory. Paul prayed for the Ephesians that they would be strengthened with power um, by God's Spirit in their inner man. The Holy Spirit is able to give us strength and give us energy. And when we come to the end of ourselves and we look to the Lord for strength, then we begin to find a strength that we wouldn't have naturally. And there's a joy that comes. There's a peace that comes. We experience the love of God in our relationship with the Lord. But then it also a strengthening comes from the Spirit. It doesn't come from us. When you, if you're empty, if you came to church today and you're, you're in a season in your life where you think, I'm just empty well, listen, you don't have to look within to find it. There's a, there's a deposit outside of you in the strength of God who knows no limits, and that strength can be put inside of you. It comes from outside of you. You're just an empty vessel. Sometimes we forget that we're easily poured out, you know, and when we realize it, God's ready to pour back in. How do we receive that? Well, we don't look in the wrong place. <laughs> we wait on the Lord. We surrender. But then you receive it. It's just an act of faith and say, Lord, here I am. Give me strength. If you're here and you're a mom and you don't know how to train your kids and discipline them and you're confused, or maybe you're now the parent of, a, of an older teenager or the parent of an adult child and you don't even know how to even speak into their life, you don't think God cares about those kids? And you, maybe you've got a conflict going and it's brought you low and there's reproaches and persecutions and now you think, well, how, what am I going to do? Well, listen, you don't know what to do. That doesn't mean anything. It just means you don't know what to do. It doesn't mean God doesn't know what to do. And you say, well, every time they know how to push my buttons. Yeah, but God doesn't have any buttons that can be pushed. <laughs> God can give you strength. God can give you what you don't have for any situation that you're in, any circumstance. And he wants to work in such a way as that we'll recognize his love for us. And tragically, so often that has to come after a time of thorn in the flesh because of our tendency to trust in ourselves. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you came today needing strength, just receive it. If you've been looking in the wrong place, stop looking in the wrong place. If you haven't surrendered, surrender, but then receive it. Just receive it. God wants to do far beyond what you could ask or even imagine and whatever the diversity of all these different people in this room and all the different circumstances that we find ourselves in, God's sufficient for every single one. 
He has a personal relationship with every single one of us. We're all directly connected to him through Jesus Christ. All of us individually can look at the grace of God for our own selves. I mean, individually, we can all receive it. Whatever it would be, God wants to do it. Strengthened by God's power. So Paul said, listen, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Sounds like a paradox until you really think about it. And then you think, no, trusting in my own self is a paradox. (laughs) You think about how silly that sounds? Yeah, I'm really strong, so I'm going to trust in myself. No, that's a paradox, bro. You ain't getting what you think you're getting if you trust in yourself. It's not a paradox to say, I'm at the end of myself, and I realize God's everything, and I'm going to trust in him. And when I'm there, I'm actually strong. Duh, that's not a paradox. That's reality. The other one is the one that's upside down. We've, the world got turned upside down, and God wants to turn it right side up. So if you're here and you're weak, we've got good news for you. In your weakness, you can find God's strength. Father, help us. We, we want to pray for the work of the Spirit to bring that strength practically. And Lord, help us, as, as your word here obviously is pretty clear, um, this issue is something that you say a lot about in your word and trusting you, waiting upon you. And so help us not to look in the wrong place. If any of us, Lord, have been looking or to some degree are looking in the wrong place, God, we pray that in the gentleness that you have and in your kindness, that you would very directly, Lord, set us free from um, looking in the wrong place. Lord, that we would just look to you. Help us, Lord, also to wait upon you. And if we're here, any of us are, are stubbornly hanging on with a death grip to something that would pull us down, Lord, set us free, that we would just wait on the Lord and we would look to you, Lord. Help us. God, may our eyes be upon Jesus. And then, Lord, give us the victory. I pray for all those that need strength, that they would receive that strength. Lord, you can do it, God, and, and we don't look, there's no one else. We don't have to buy it. We don't have to pay money for a magic potion or send in our check or something. Lord, you give it freely to those that look to you. So God, give us strength. We're at the end of ourselves, Lord. We need your strength. May your strength may be, may be made perfect in our weakness. And Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.